When establishing a villain in a story, there's often an intention to make their presence as intimidating as possible. This character serves as the greatest conflict against the protagonist's beliefs and goals, and the audience should be able to feel that in some sense. There are innumerable ways to establish a commanding villain. It can be through powerful lines of dialogue, an iconic and threatening design, a spine-tingling theme or motif, giving them a great number of proficiencies or intelligence, clearly establishing their power level, or all of the above, if you're good enough. Take, for example, the Nazgûls in The Lord of the Rings. Calling any of them characters in any sense is being a little generous. They barely speak any lines of dialogue throughout the entire trilogy, and aside from the Witch King, they're basically all the exact same character. They're pawns of Sauron's who were corrupted by the Rings of Power and they want to return the One Ring to its creator. They still remain threatening villains throughout the entire trilogy, however, through many of the aforementioned techniques. They're these shadowy figures cloaked in darkness who bear so little resemblance to their former human bodies that you never see any of their faces. Pretty much the only time any of them speak, they do so in this goblin-esque alien voice, and the rest of what you hear from them is blood-curdling shrieking. Anytime they're around, they're accompanied by one of the most oppressive tracks you've ever heard in a movie. Their power escalates over the course of the trilogy, first through riding on horseback with their Morgul blades, later on they're riding fell beasts, and then they end with the Witch King proudly riding his special fell beast with this comically oversized mace. It's clear through their presentation in the story alone that they serve as a great threat to the Fellowship's goal of destroying the One Ring, and they put everyone they come across in grave danger. There are many great ways of building that same level of intimidation in a villain through obfuscation of one of these elements. In fact, the faceless aspect of the Nazgul's is a perfect demonstration of what I mean, but there are so many other great examples that you can draw from. Fire Lord Ozai in Avatar The Last Airbender, you know, the good version of it, is a great example of this. His power and threat level are immediately made clear to you just through his title alone, but he's made so much more impactful from the fact that you barely hear him speak and you don't see his face in the present time period until book 3. All you're left with is build-up for two entire seasons of the show. You hear and see how he treats his children, you hear the actions he commands the Fire Nation army to carry out that ends up traumatizing and harming every other character, all the while the imagery you associate him with is a shadow, surrounded by walls of roaring flames accompanied by yet another terrifying theme. Hearing characters talk about him rather than directly to him, or hearing him speak so sparsely, creates a level of tension because he's an enigmatic entity more than he is a human being with fears and weaknesses. All culminating into a final season of development, making this final battle feel satisfying from a character development standpoint, and sells you on how powerful and responsible Aang has become from how he began the series. It's equally as valuable to understand why and how some villains that sound as though they should be intimidating in theory end up falling flat or forgettable in practice. Eosef and John Wick is a recent example I came across midway through writing this video. I don't think the movie is trying to sell Eosef as a threatening or big bad villain, to be clear. The way he's written makes it clear he's supposed to be leaning more towards Prince Humperdinck than he is Thanos. He has no real purpose in the plot aside from pissing off John Wick so he can commit mass murder with a bumpin' rave party going on in the background. Hell yeah, dude! It's just interesting to compare him to the former two villains I mentioned because Eosef does immediately establish himself as a threat. He assaults John in his own home and kills his dog just because he wasn't willing to sell his car after one random conversation at a gas station? By all accounts, you've established a threat level pretty early on, but every conversation after this point with Eosef is essentially hammering into your skull that this was the worst mistake he's ever gonna make. It turns out, yeah, John Wick has a dead wife. Your mistake, buddy! You should've done your research! You're never gonna make it out of this movie alive! If anything, funnily enough, this movie does the inverse of what Fire Lord Ozai does. This character is used as a device to talk up and build suspense for the protagonist's threat level. John is intelligent, he's good at planning, he's experienced, he's composed, and he has a kill count higher than the word count of this script. Eosef is not an equal to him, in fact, he embodies the exact opposite qualities. Eosef spends the rest of the movie cowering in fear, and the movie doesn't even give his final scene any real weight despite his assassination being the goal for two-thirds of the story because he's just another one of the 12 people you've seen get shot in this sequence alone. None of this is to say that he failed to fulfill his role in the story. This was all how he was meant to come off. I'm 100% certain of that. I just think it's really interesting to see how you can end up making a character who could be terrifying and turn them into more of an afterthought than a threat. Moreover, it's important to recognize that even if your villain isn't a threatening one or someone who challenges the protagonist, they can still offer significant utility to the story. Through these three examples, I just hope it's apparent how many different ways you can make a villain terrifying or otherwise useful if they aren't terrifying. And I've barely scratched the surface of how creatively you could spin any and all of these ideas. 
Following on the idea of using obfuscation effectively, one of my absolute favorite means of building a villain's presence is through weaponizing silence. In this video, I want to talk about two of my favorite villains who both utilize this to great effect and how they make it work in different ways. And yes, I'm doing this on April Fool's Day. I'm doing this on April Fool's Day. I'm doing this on April Fool's Day. <laughs> There will be massive spoilers for Whiplash and Breaking Bad in this video, so please click away if you haven't experienced these stories. If you've seen both stories or you're okay with being spoiled, let's talk about how silence can make a villain terrifying. Now I want to start with Terrence Fletcher and Whiplash. I can only imagine the first thing you're thinking if you've watched this movie is, Shrunk, what the hell are you talking about? Fletcher screams and aggressively insults his students for probably 80% of his time on screen. In what way is that utilizing silence? In this story, I think he's built to be something to be feared because of how he commands everyone else in such a way that you can associate a lack of sound with his presence. Where you can associate a villain like the Prowler from Into the Spider-Verse through his theme, you associate silence befalling the room with Fletcher. This is a story about musicians, more specifically drummers, and the drums aren't known for being a quiet instrument. Point being, this is a movie where Neiman's goal is to perfect that sound and become an elite drummer. Since Fletcher wields command over the entire ensemble and proves that he will readily halt the piece at the slightest imperfection, it makes every pause, every second, of nothing being said or played into this anxiety-ridden sharp inhale. This tension is established along with half a dozen other things in the movie's first scene. The movie opens on Neiman steadily ramping up the speed of his playing and is then immediately undercut by Fletcher's entrance. The scene becomes so uncomfortable so quickly because outside of the dialogue, it is dead silent. Did I ask you to start playing again? Uh, sorry, I asked I why something. you stopped playing and your version of an answer was to turn into a wind-up monkey. Sorry, I thought... Show me your rudiments. The dialogue on its own is brutal and awkward in the best way, but it helps the scene so much that there's nothing auditory to distract from it. It'd be easy for Damien Chazelle or Andy Ross to throw in like a low-key track here just to fill in the gaps of dead air, but they don't. A lot of movies and shows seem really uncomfortable leaving you in complete dead silence too often because it can feel unnatural or as though something's missing, like somebody didn't do their job properly. But here it's already wordlessly telling you how much power Fletcher wields over Neiman. Again, it would be so easy, not to mention lazy, to have this introduction voice everything over from Neiman's perspective to fill us in on everything. Yup, that's me. I'm a first year student at Schaefer University. I'm a drummer. I play the drums. <laughs> it's sort of my thing. <laughs> that guy is Terrence Fletcher. He's the esteemed conductor of the Schaefer Conservatory Jazz Band. No! We don't need anything like that because Damien Chazelle is built different. The dialogue is never subjugated for exposition's sake, and the scene is able to directly and effectively articulate so much while saying very little because of it. The presentation of the story itself is changed by Fletcher, and it doesn't by any means stop at this scene. This becomes so much more apparent when you pay attention to Neiman's first on-screen rehearsal with his original conductor. He never lets a mistake be the center of focus for longer than a couple seconds. That's enough for that. Just back to the core drums, please. Fletcher makes it feel like years are going by while you attempt to recognize what the hell's making him angry now. Is that really the fastest you can play, you worthless Jaime fuck? While so much of what people likely remember Fletcher for is his ability to shout homophobic slurs at his students, those insults and verbal assaults cut even deeper than they otherwise would when he attempts to lower their guard in such a manipulative fashion. Everybody remembers this first major example before Neiman's attempt to acclimate to the new band. Fletcher, in this personable and chillax tone, tells Andrew that he's there for a reason, he shouldn't take any of this too seriously. Then the pin drops, and all of a sudden, every rule changes. Despite Fletcher counting from five frequently, when Andrew does the same thing, he gets yelled at, even though it would make zero difference whether or not he was counting in four. Start counting. Five, six, seven. In four, damn it! Look at me! The tempo is just a little bit important to Fletcher, and it's a topic of debate whether Neiman was actually off tempo at all, or if Fletcher is just an asshole. Because all of this has been prefaced wrongly with this affable speech, the contrast pushes the drama as high as it can possibly go. 
It's not just the character's manipulation tactics that make this so striking, however. The camera conveys the impact of this assault on Andrew. You'll notice during this rehearsal that the camera is handheld for most of the shots focusing on Fletcher's conducting. A lot of the shots you see of the band playing are static, and they look and feel really fancy. Look at the reflections off the instruments, look at the lighting, those are some really nice shots. More importantly, the handheld shots of Fletcher are steady. Nothing's moving too fast, and you're held at a comfortable distance to be able to see everybody. You might be noticing a subtle difference that, uh, this is not how this confrontation is shot at all. Not only is it handheld, but it's shakily handheld, as if even the guy holding the camera is scared to watch this. It is extremely close up, which makes even a minor adjustment like Neiman sitting up straight feel like a massive deal visually speaking. No other confrontation between two characters in this movie is shot this way. As far as this movie is concerned, this technique is Fletcher's and his alone. I know it sounds rich to describe Fletcher as a villain who uses silence effectively, but I think his character is the best example I've seen of it by dictating the tone and sound direction of an entire movie. With how quick to criticize he is, when he stops everyone's playing and leaves you with those few seconds of nothing, it can make your mind race. You begin wondering whether or not somebody even made a genuine mistake. Is he going to assault someone this time or just resort to petty insults? How much worse can he get? It says a lot that these first few rehearsal scenes can still make you so uncomfortable even on a rewatch, because if his character really was just relentless yelling, you'd get used to it eventually, right? I mean, Neiman evidently does. My dad says that I have, I have trouble making eye contact. When did you become a fucking expert on what I can or cannot do, you fucking weepy willow shit sack? I earned that part. You never earned anything. God, you are a self-righteous prick. The only reason you're a fucking core is because- but Fletcher isn't some dumbass, he's just so far gone and desperate to create a success story out of somebody to vicariously live through that he comes across as a maniac, and rightfully so. That's the thing, it's all so very calculated how he goes about torturing his students, Neiman particularly, and the movie wants you to know it. When the conventions of a movie's presentation is being dictated by one character, it's being done for a reason, and it works. It really works. Fletcher, to this day, is one of the most terrifying villains I've encountered in anything. My second and favorite example of a silently powerful villain is Gustavo Fring of Breaking Bad. Gus is the most powerful villain in the series aside from Walter, and I think it's fantastic the way the writers managed to pull it off. If I had to single out just one thing to applaud Breaking Bad for, which is kind of difficult, honestly, it would be how the show escalates tension over the course of the series. The threat level steadily ramps up with an effortlessness that I'm frankly jealous of. I write a couple dozen minutes worth of video with jumpy transitions and a trail mix's assortment of thoughts scrambled together, and this show can be this tightly written masterwork of drama for 49 hours. Life isn't fair. The showrunners have such a finesse with knowing how to slow things down and build back up to these jaw-dropping moments like it's nothing. I find this to be impressive in respect to the villains because the show starts with Tuco as the main villain of season 1 and 2. Now let me preface this conversation by saying that I love Tuco, and I think he's a great villain in his own right. Raymond Cruz is an absolute riot as this character, and I wish in my 22 years of life so far I could have managed to write something half as funny as This kid's like a mule with his balls wrapped in duct tape. tape! That said, I think it ended up being something of a blessing in disguise how Raymond Cruz's scheduling complications made the writers kill Tuco off earlier than they initially meant to. The reason I say this is because after Walter stands up to him in season 1, you can't really escalate much higher than that with the same character. In other words, Tuco plays his full hand pretty early on. The only real way you could make him more of a threat is if he tries to kill Walt and Jesse, which, what do you know, that's the last thing he tries to do before he bites the dust. He's certainly unpredictable, he's drugged out of his mind in every scene he's in, and you know he has little, if any, restraint in regards to violence, or just in general. The thing is, as an audience member, you know what he'll do, there's little intrigue as to what he'll try to get away with, and it's more of a nail-biter waiting to see what benign thing will set him off on a rampage. In other words, imagine if Terrence Fletcher really was just a guy who yelled a lot, and that was all there was to the character. Again, if you're exposed to that side for too long, you risk losing that element of surprise when the character outwardly isn't very intelligent. He needs a hospital! Do something! You're smart, right? Do that, do that thing! When you feed the audience little tidbits of information about a character at a time, with the right delivery, it can let the viewer's imagination run wild wondering what this character will do. The unknown will always be one of the scariest things you can make someone confront, and I think they execute that so well with Gus. The first time he's mentioned in the franchise, it immediately makes him this mystery man that even Saul Goodman doesn't know anything about. 
Saul has connections to seemingly every obscure service in Albuquerque, and even he only knows Gus as this faceless guy that he only knows through his connection with Mike, and it'll be a cold day in hell before you get any information out of him. What I find even more fascinating is how, even after meeting Gus and learning the extent of his presence in the criminal underworld, he's still just as threatening throughout seasons 3 and 4. With how cold and calculated the man is, you barely see his expression change to anything besides kingpin mode or customer service mode for an entire season. Any challenges the man runs into are things that he's expected or planned a contingency for. Even if he technically didn't plan around it at all, you would never know that. Again, so much of this can just be felt as an audience member through how sparingly Gus will speak or even be on screen at all. If you see him at all, it's because he has something to tell you and you won't get to decide when that is. Anytime you see his expression change, it's always at least a little ambiguous trying to pinpoint what he's thinking. Gus maintains this aura of perfection. The man dresses in a full suit for just about any occasion, and he never fails to unbutton it when sitting down and rebutton it when standing. The man is still almost alien to you with how uncomfortably controlled he is in every aspect of his life. In the 11th episode of season 3, Gus invites Walter over for dinner to warn him against having too much faith and trust in Jesse. This introduces a major conflict between Walt, Jesse, and Gus that will go on to irreversibly change the fate of every character in the series. What's even more unnerving about the scene is that before it ends up building to that, Gus prefaces it all with this calculated sense of warmth when Walt walks in. The first shot you see in Gus's home is roughly 17 seconds long and for 10 of those seconds you can see a toy car and a children's dinner table in the center of the frame. It's pretty easy to say that they wanted you to notice this, and Gus soon mentions how he never gets the chance to make the meal he's preparing because kids won't eat it. This bit of information alone actually made some viewers think that Gus has a family, which isn't a far-fetched thing to believe at this point in the show. However, it all feels like a giant lie, and you can tell Walt feels the same way with how visibly uncomfortable he is. Gus is behaving incredibly uncharacteristically friendly and nostalgic. He's talking about his love for his mother's cooking and his appreciation for the senses and how they remind him of his childhood. Does this character look like someone who has felt love for anything? He's willing to do this much setup just to attempt to lower Walt's guard for this one conversation. This is all backed by the fact that when Gus invites Jesse over for dinner in Season 4 Episode 9, none of the aforementioned toys or talk of nostalgia are present whatsoever. If they are, this scene doesn't show either. Jesse isn't willing to play along with Gus's appearances and Gus knows that he has to be direct with Jesse. Gus also knew prior to this first dinner scene that Walt's family is very important to him and accordingly used that to lure him into a false sense of trust to do what he wants him to do. Being so prepared for anything that minor is scary and it helps build Gus's persona as a man without weakness and unlike Tuco, he's composed at all times. He's so composed that this scene of him in an elevator after being questioned by the DEA where he has a slight hand twitch is the most human emotion you see from him that far into the season. Again, think of doing the same thing with Tuco and it just doesn't work. You've seen him beat a guy within an inch of his life and howl like a hyena. You're not going to get that same thing to work. This is why, in the first episode of Season 4, when Gus pulls out a box cutter and kills Victor without saying a word, it scares the shit out of everybody, including Mike. On the holy shit this guy should scare you scale, surprising Mike Ehrmantraut by default puts you pretty much just yup all the way over here. Relative to the rest of the on-screen murders you see in this show, this one feels the most uncomfortable in how, as I've mentioned several times before, Gus says nothing and looks as composed as you can get away with by slicing a man's neck open while standing up. Even when Walt tries to assume Gus's role later on in Season 5 with the coordinated prison murders, there's something about it that feels less threatening despite the sequence still having its own unique horror to it. Again, compare this to any other one-on-one -on -one scene of a character murdering somebody prior and it's night and day. Walt killing Crazy 8, for example, is this brutally built up episode long conflict that Walt tries to get out of in several ways. First by hoping Jesse loses the coin flip, which is sacred by the way, then by weighing his options and the consequences they would each have, and finally he ends up committing to it once he realizes that it's either him or Crazy 8. The physical confrontation itself is roughly 30 seconds long and is loud, it's dirty, both parties are struggling and grunting, and after it ends... <laughs> I'm so sorry. But even when you compare Box Cutter to the episode just before, it's just as jarringly different. Jesse killing Gale is a much shorter scene than the one of Walter and Crazy 8, but because this show is unbelievable, it's even more heartbreaking despite being a much shorter ordeal altogether. 
Jesse hesitates for 40 seconds after pulling out his gun, and again, you see how both him and Gale don't want this to happen. Gale begs and pleads to give up whatever Jesse wants. Both of them start crying, and Aaron Paul's expression alone convinces you that this is somehow going to hurt Jesse more than it hurts Gale. Boxcutter's altercation is certainly a struggle, but unlike the murders that came before, the murderer himself shows no regret, not a shred of doubt, and not a second of hesitation, despite having by far the longest connection to the victim compared to these two. Gus ends a man's life, somebody who he carefully had to select as a grunt for his drug ring and who remained loyal to Gus that entire time like it's nothing. The thing that cements Gus as the best villain other than Walter in this show to me is because he's by far the biggest threat to Walt outside of his own pride. Walt's defining characteristic and tool for surviving most of this show is that he's extremely intelligent. Even when he's out of his element, he's extremely good at planning things out and recognizing the smallest details that he can take advantage of. That is, unless it comes to Skylar, who is adept at noticing when he's full of shit, but that's not the point, is it? So having a character who's in so many ways Walt's equal in that respect makes the third and fourth season especially into this 4D chess game where you watch these two masterminds manipulating Jesse and trying to coerce him over to their side. Again, compare that to ESF and John Wick, and the two characters are equals in no respect. They don't challenge each other beyond wanting to murder the other person. <laughs> Gus actually pushes Walt to his limits in the one area where he's gone on challenge thus far in the show. Tuco is scary in different ways, but you never get the idea that Tuco is outsmarting Walt in much of any sense. He's just crazy. <laughs> Compare the both of them to Fletcher and Gus, who are scary, but in a controlled and deliberate way that challenges the main character. Not only is Gus holistically as smart as Walt is, but he has so much more to work with in the way of resources that it means he only loses when he lets his guard down or if his pride drives him, which may or may not be a pretty key theme of the show, because we all know how Gus's story ends. <laughs> I've attributed the power of these villains largely to utilizing silence effectively, but I've ended up going on about half a dozen other things that make them work in tandem with that. In doing so, I think it just goes to show how much work has to go into making a memorable character. While I find this particular aspect ties these two characters together in a way that I really appreciate, just think of how many other things went into making these two into the show stealers that they became. The brilliant performances by J.K. Simmons and Giancarlo Esposito, the build-up and payoff established by the writers, the presence maintained due to the effective camera work and sound direction. All of these things and more had to be done right to create these two characters with such a legendary impact on their respective stories. It can't all be attributed to keeping an audio track vacant. It's a testament to the craft on display between all of the hard-working, creative people bringing these characters to life. And how ironic is that, to appreciate the collaborative aspect of art after talking about two characters that, if nothing else, are intent on ripping the main character away from everyone they care about. While I wouldn't call myself much of a professional writer or editor, I do think it goes unmentioned just how effective it can be to give the audience those moments of silence to make a character even stronger. If you let the audience's mind do the work for you, you can create even more fear by doing less. When your villain is so strong that they change the story's presentational conventions, the silence can end up being incredibly loud. It can transform a villain that's okay into a villain that's unforgettable. Thanks for watching everybody, and I hope you have a good one. Point being, this is a movie where Neiman's goal is to perfect that sound and become an elite drive- <laughs> Driver. Fuck off. <laughs> Fucking Xenoblade. God damn it. <laughs>